Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today we continue our series on opportunity and season of opportunity. And today we're going to have our theme is from obstacles to opportunity. In fact, not just today, but also next week, we're going to have a two-part sermon on obstacles to opportunity. And so as I began to think about obstacles in life and the challenges we face, I thought, hmm, where do they come from? Where, are, where do they exist? And I thought about family relationships can create obstacles, disappointments in our love life, disappointments in friendships or with friends. Maybe there's a disappointment in our academic endeavors, or maybe there's an obstacle in the, our career endeavors, or maybe we have obstacles with health or financial obstacles. I could see that being a prominent issue in today's world. Or maybe we just have an existential crisis that creates an obstacle. Yet these challenges, or what I call obstacles in life, impact us and create or expose areas of our personal weakness. That's what I like to think of it as. And so I thought about personal obstacles that we might face on a personal level. Maybe we have a lack of patience that gets in the way. Or maybe we have a lack of discipline or of knowledge or a lack of inspiration. Maybe we lack a lack of desire or passion in life. Maybe we lack a skill. These are all obstacles. And least but not last, the obstacle of fear, the fear of change. And that's a cultural phenomenon. I think it's a landmine all by itself. That's a sermon for a different day. But these are all personal obstacles that we face in life. So I got to thinking, how does God build our struggles? And I think about it in, this, in these terms, that there is no one who understands us like he knows what we are going through and will give us a way to escape, as we talked about last week in the message. But we have to learn to trust God so we can say yes and begin to say yes to life. It's full of struggles and trials and pain, but if we trust God, he will get us through it. Whether we are rich or poor, we're still going to have struggles and God is still going to be with us. They will come to us no matter what. Sometimes our struggles and, ob and, and, and obstacles will come in a small, maybe it's just a drizzle. And another day it's just a downpour of obstacles that come into our place. No matter what, God promises to walk with us and be with us. In fact, in Scripture, there's a couple passages I want to share with you to let us know that God is with us in the midst of our obstacles. In Psalm 9, verses 9 and 10, it says, The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. I love that text. It reminds us that no matter what the obstacle is, God is our stronghold in no matter what the obstacle might be, whatever the trouble might be that we face. And then in Psalm 34, verse 10, it says, Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing, that no matter what, in the midst of trial, in the midst of tri tribulation, in the midst of an obstacle, we lack no good thing if God is by our side. And finally, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 26, he writes, Those of steadfast mind who keep in peace because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord you have an everlasting rock. And I love that, that the, the, Isaiah reminds us that no matter how big of an obstacle we may face, that our foundation is set on the rock of Christ in our lives. And it reminds me of the old children's song, The wise man built his house upon the, the rock. And so it's so important to be. He didn't build it on the sand, he built it on the rock. And so we too have to build our house upon the rock. We need to put our foundation today, as we look at obstacles, that our foundation is in Christ. That that is our foundation. And then one of the things about these obstacles that we'll look at today and next week is that there's so much to learn from our obstacles and challenges. They open us up to change if we deal with them. They make us examine our priorities sometimes to relook at ourselves. And maybe they point us to options we never thought about. They engage our creativity when we're looking at obstacles. And they slow us down to help us choose the right path, or at least a better path than we're on. And what I like to think is they also can create a new meaning around a new purpose when we face those obstacles. Sometimes they redefine. They redefine our progress as a series, maybe, of small steps. And I thought about this, that obstacles, when confronted, provide us opportunities to see, to hear, and to be. See, obstacles can provide us an opportunity to see, to hear, and to be, to be something we didn't know existed within us. And I think that's what obstacles bring to us. 
So I thought about why is it important for us to overcome obstacles? Obstacles make us tougher. They build us up. And so instead, we can look at it in the face and resolve to get beyond the obstacle. And in that process, it's like working out with weights. The more you work out, the stronger you get. The more exercise you do, the more stamina you get. So when we face obstacles, they make us tougher. They make us stronger. Obstacles, obstacles give us a chance to practice courage. I like that. That obstacles give us the opportunity to practice courage. Courage to improve our situation. Courage to improve the world around us. Courage to improve ourselves. In fact, I want to come back to a, a verse in, in the Bible in Psalm 27, verse 1, which reminds us the power of letting God be our strength who strengthens us. So the, the Psalm 27, verse 1 says, The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil people advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Did you hear that? They will stumble and fall, he says. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Through war break out, the war break out against me. Even then will I be confident. And I think that when we know that God is with us, that God is with us in the midst of obstacles, we can be confident, as the psalmist writes here in the 27th Psalm, that we can be confident no matter what, what comes at us, no matter what, what obstacles come at us, we can be confident in God. So as I thought about the obstacles that we face in life and have faced, it led me to look at Scripture. To look at Scripture to see how some of God's chosen respond to obstacles. And as I begin our look at these obstacles that some of God's chosen have faced, I want to begin with Job. I think Job is one of the, has one of the greatest illustrations of how to face your obstacles. And I thought what's interesting about Job is, and sometimes we can, we can identify with where Job finds himself, is Job's, some of his biggest obstacles with those closest to him. Some of Job's biggest obstacles with those who surrounded him. As we read, if we read through the book of Job, we see constantly it's his friends who become his greatest obstacle, who create his biggest challenge. In fact, in Job chapter 30, verses 9 and 10, it says, And now I am there taunting, there taunting Solomon. Yes, I am their byword. They, bought, they abhor me. They keep far from me. They do not hesitate to spit in my face. I look, the words are Job is wrestling with those around him. And I think sometimes some of our biggest obstacles can come from those nearest to us. Just ask Job. When the adversary throws the kitchen sink at Job in the beginning of the story, he kills all of Job's livestock to begin with. He burns down all his fields, then he works slowly but destroying his whole entire family. In fact, he gives Job the confidence of a leper, which means he has no confidence at the time. Yet all of Job's friends seem to turn on him. Yet Job seems to endure every obstacle that the adversary can throw at him, including his friends. We learn a valuable lesson from Job that sometimes when obstacles come our way, we have to learn to wait. To wait upon the Lord to rescue us, to shut out the outside noise, to shut out what our friends might be saying to us, to listen to what the Lord is trying to say to us. In fact, in Job 42, chapter 42 of Job, verses 2 to 6, he says, Know, Lord, that you are all-powerful, that you can do everything you want. You ask how I dare question your wisdom when I am so very ignorant. I talked about things I did not understand, about marvels too great for me to know. You told me to listen while you spoke and to try to answer your questions. In the past, I knew only what others had told me. But now, I have seen you with my own eyes, so I am ashamed of all I have said and repent in dust and ashes. Job got it. He had listened to his friends too much. He realized he had to put with their voices and their outside obstacles away and get them out of his life so he could hear what God was saying. And sometimes we have those personal obstacles of people right around us who can get in our way and create one obstacle after another. And we have to hear what Job said. He said, I had to put them aside and see what God was saying. I think we have to hear those words. Job teaches us to be humble before God. No matter the depth of our obstacles and those around us, we have to come back and say, God, what are you trying to tell me? What are you trying to have me hear right now? Help me to hear what you have me to, what I need to hear, Lord, because I need to shut this out. 
And I think he surrenders himself to God. I think that's really important. Job surrenders himself to God and admits that he doesn't understand, but has to trust only in God. Can't we all say ditto to Job's revelation that we sometimes have to push everything aside and say, Lord, I surrender. Here I am. Let me just hear you. Let me sh shut out those people right around me. Help me, Lord. But I think like Job, we all have to travel through the storm before we can see, before we can begin to comprehend or begin to understand all that we have been through. And that's that's why this verse comes at the end of Job, not at the beginning. Job has to go through that whole storm and everything and all the obstacles around him from those closest to him before he can really see. He has to go through the storm to understand, okay, Lord, I need to be quiet and just listen to you. Sometimes our obstacles are in maybe the not yet or not in our time. In fact, we find that in Scripture in the next verse. In fact, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13, David is appealing to, to Yahweh and saying, Lord, I want to build you a house. I want to build you a house that, that belongs to you. I want to build you a place where the people, your chosen people can come and worship you. I want to build you a house, Lord. I want to build you a house. So I want to do this. And yet Nathan, the prophet come, and the priest comes to Samuel and he says to them, when your days are fulfilled, David, and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This is Nathan talking to David, saying, you're not going to build the house of the Lord. You've built a great city. You've built a beautiful palace. But you are not, not, hear my words, not going to build the house of the Lord. King David had to accept this obstacle that God had put before him. For this was a great obstacle for David. For David was set on building a house for the Lord. For every time he looked out his palace window, all he saw was this giant tent, this tabernacle that had gone through the wilderness and now was here set in Jerusalem. He wanted to build God a beautiful house in which to worship. And the prophet says, no, you can't build it. He knew in all his heart and mind that that tent was not satisfactory for the Lord his God. But, but Yahweh had to have the plans. And sometimes God's obstacle to us is saying, no, not yet. Or maybe just no, as he said to David here. Sometimes God may place obstacles or roadblocks in front of us because it's not in his time for us, for you and I. We may pray for something and want something to come about, and we ask God, why can't this be? And yet God may be saying, no, not yet. Maybe, just wait. This was definitely the case with King David. When, he, when we look back on the story, the building of the temple would rest with his son, King Solomon. And I think we can all identify with King David wanting to build the temple, wanting to do something for God, wanting God to use us for some way. But God said, no, David, you can't do it. It's not my time. It's not, it's not in your time either. Sometimes we wonder why God was to put this delay and this obstacle in front of David. But maybe we can ask the same question of ourselves. Why has God put this obstacle in front of me? Why has God said no to me? And I began to reflect on that. This was a hard question for me this week, a really challenging question. I had to ask myself, what, is God, what has God said no to? Or not yet, or wait, or maybe not in your time. And I began to reflect on the 22 years of ministry here at Good Shepherd. And I began to ask myself this question. I realized this is an obstacle for me. Why can't God use me to move the ministry of Good Shepherd forward? Bringing in more people, bringing more people to know Christ. Why can't God use me to do that? That was the question that hit me right in space. Why can't I build a temple for God here? For God's people to come and worship here in this place. I asked, that was my question I put in myself this week. And I began to ask, I said, why God? And I, all of a sudden I realized this was David's question to the Lord. Why God can I not build you a place worthy of you? Why can't I be used to bring in people to know you more, Lord, here in this place? What have I not done, I asked myself. Where have I, have I been unfaithful to the Lord? What have I done wrong? The 
temptation came to the door, who do I blame? And all I could do was blame myself. Sometimes the pressure tries to sink in and sneak into my life and take, take over when I began to realize what, what's wrong. I began sometimes to feel inferior that there's something wrong with me. I, I must not be a very good pastor. That sometimes I feel useless. Grand disappointment, I guess is worse. You see, sometimes we have to be like Israel. And I have to be like David. And we have to see what the answer to these questions might be. And maybe it's not going to be in my time. Or in my lifetime to see what God has planned for this place. So I began to ask myself these questions, so, and I began to think about where David was in our text and why God had placed so great an obstacle before David. We can only speculate. But when we look at the building of the temple after David passed on, and we look at the grandeur of the temple, it matched the grandeur of the empire that was Israel under King Solomon. So God had a plan that just didn't include David. So sometimes obstacles can be like that. But then there are obstacles outside of God and God's plan. Sometimes there are obstacles that the world throws at us. Not God, but the world. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes it this way in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-7. It is true that we live in the world, but we do not fight from worldly motives. The weapons we use in our fight are not the world's weapons, but God's powerful weapons, which we use to destroy strongholds. We destroy false arguments. We pull down every proud obstacle that is raised against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive and make it obey Christ. See, what Paul is talking about is we as the church are called to take on the world, that the world will throw weapons upon us. The world will throw obstacles at us. And I think we can look around and begin to see some of those in our world. The Apostle Paul speaks to the obstacles that the world used to throw us off. The world uses obstacles to throw us off, to get us off the path that Christ wants us on. That Paul reminds us about who we're supposed to be fighting. That the world's obstacles are derived to get our faith game off. What I mean by that is the world will throw obstacles us where we find ourselves forgetting what we're about, that the church forgets who it is and what it is about. They forget that we're about Christ and Christ's love. We forget that we're about the great commandment to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and thy neighbor as ourself. That's the great commandment. All things, everything else falls under that umbrella. That is the umbrella of faith. And sometimes the world throws things at us and the umbrella comes crashing down because we forget that we are about the great commandment to love the Lord thy God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbor as ourself. That that has to be the premise from, every, from which everything we do in the church and everything we do as Christians. Paul reminds us that Christ grants us tools. He grants us the gifts to take on the obstacles that the world entices us with. And I think it's very true that the obstacles of the world come from all arguments that help take us away from our main argument, which is Christ as Lord, as Savior of our lives. The argument that wants us to believe that there is no God. There's a world out there that wants to believe that there is no God. In fact, I agree. I, agree. I received a wonderful email from Terry Ishar, our 94-year-old, who is who's, a, who's part of our Bible study, is faithful in Bible study every Tuesday night. And he sent me this, this wonderful email the other day. It's a story about an atheist who goes to court in Florida and wants to petition the court for a holiday for atheists. So he petitions the court and says, you know, the Jews have their holidays, they have the Passover, they have, they have, they have Yom Kippur, they have Hanukkah, and the Christians, they have Easter, they have, they have Christmas, they have all these holidays. Atheists don't have a holiday. We should have a holiday. I'm fighting for the right for us to have a holiday. And the judge says, case dismissed. So the lawyer for, for the plaintiff goes up to the judge and what do you mean dismissed? I made these arguments. It's true that we have this. And the judge says, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Wait a second. You have your holiday. He goes, what are you talking about? What holiday do we have? The judge looks at him. April 1st. And the lawyer didn't understand what he was saying. He said, what do you mean April 1st? He said, April Fool's Day. 
And then again, the lawyer looked confused. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, in the scripture, it says that the, anyone who, who says there is no God is a fool. Case dismissed. There goes your heart. The world throws so many obstacles in our way, claiming there's no God, there, there's no way to be, to be the church, there's no way to follow Christ. The world throws these at the Lord grants it, the Lord grants us the wisdom to know that our authority to overcome all the obstacles that the world throws at us is through Christ. The cross of Christ and the empty tomb have the final words against all the obstacles that exist. And I thought about the challenge of obstacles throughout the history. I thought about how obstacles around the world can change the world, can change the dynamics of a nation, of a people. In our own nation, in the 1800s, we saw the world coming down on America, of the United States, to a point where the, the United States was divided. Southern states, slave states versus free states. The northern states versus the southern states. And during 1859, the Republican Party was established and, and Lincoln became their nominee. And, and as, he, as he proclaimed on his platform, he said, we have to be a united states. We have to be a united union, not a divided union. And that was his platform. Yet so many in the North wanted him to proclaim slavery as the issue, to divide and, and, and conquer the southern states who wanted slavery to be the norm. And so Lincoln ran on the concept of uniting the union. It was powerful what Lincoln did. That he, as he became president, he still took on the challenge. The world around him was calling him from all ends of his life. One side was saying, we have to be in slavery. The other side, we have to keep slavery. He found himself torn between two worlds, both worlds coming in on him, both coming in on him, and he was in the middle. And as Lincoln was debating what to do with this issue, he realized he had to make a decision about where to, believe, where to find himself in the world. So finally, at the end of 1862, in a private place, he wrote the words that became the Emancipation Proclamation Act. And as he wrote those words, he presented them to the nation, to Congress, on July 1st, 1863. And after he had made that tough decision with the world coming in upon him, I want, you, I want to read to you what he said to Congress and friends in a book called The Zealot and the Emancipator, written by H.W. Brands. Lincoln says, Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. No personal significance or insignificance can spare one or another of us. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. We say we are for the Union. The world will not forget that we say this. We know how to save the Union. The world knows we do not know how to save it. We, we even here hold the power and bear the responsibility in giving freedom to the slave. We assure freedom to the free, honorable alike in what we give and what we preserve. We shall nobly say we merely lose the last best hope of earth. Other means may succeed. This could not fail. The way is plain, peaceful, generous, just. A way which it followed, the world will forever applaud. And God must forever bless. Lincoln's decision when the world was coming around said, we're going to do this because I'm going to trust what God's going to help me do. Even though Lincoln was not a highly religious man, he knew that the only way this was going to work, to take on the world that was had him in the middle, was to trust what God would lead him. And therefore, he wrote the Emancipation Proclamation Act on his own. And he established the Emancipation Proclamation Act. Yet it would haunt him from the day he accepted that nomination of the Republican Party throughout his presidency. 
Prior to the presentation of the Emancipation Proclamation Act on July 1st, 1863, he had been considered a betrayer of those who had voted for him. You see, we can look back on history and say it was a no-brainer. Of course, Lincoln had to write the Emancipation Proclamation Act and present it to Congress. Free the slaves, like, duh, that's, that's, that's a no-brainer. It's easy to think of that, that revisionist history. But if we are to put on the shoes and wear the stovetop hat of Lincoln, we too would realize the overwhelming obstacle for Lincoln was twofold. Preserve the Union, reunite the succession states, and emancipate the slaves. I close with this today because I want you to think and reflect over the next week on the obstacles that you have faced in your life. Which ones have been created by those closest to you? Which obstacles have created the greatest disappointment, as in King David? What obstacles have the world, society, put on your plate that you have to surrender to God as Lincoln had to surrender his overwhelming challenge? And as you do, it will prepare you for next week's part two of this message. And we continue our theme on obstacles to opportunity by looking at obstacles that are overwhelming, obstacles that often open us to potential of what God can do, obstacles that have us sometimes sitting on the fence, as we even see with Lincoln, and obstacles that lead us to do the unexpected. Think about those obstacles this week. Pray about how God has used those obstacles to help you grow in faith. And may you trust in God to get you through whatever obstacles you're facing right now. And join me next week as we continue to, to work through how God uses obstacles to make new opportunities for all of us. Until next week, God bless you all and keep you safe.